We rarely have repeat performances, back-to-back year, -back years, I'll but... Never be, I'll never be invited again, then. Oh, you'll be invited every year. But here's a quick question for you. Um, you've had a year to settle in, mm -hmm. moving from politics, uh, titles like Gucci Hele, to philanthropy and CEO of, at a time where crises seems to be everywhere. Yep. How's it been? I've had an amazing year. Uh, I have the good fortune now to work for an organization uh, that reaches about 60 million children every year. We work in 120 countries. 17,000 people are every day everywhere on this globe working for children. And it's such a, an amazing thing to go home uh, every day and know that you have done something to change a child's life somewhere uh, in this world. I think somewhere in this world would really bring up stories that we read in the media and sometimes get a little bit numb to, um, like in Syria. I want to put up a couple of pictures uh, that Save the Children have. There have been bombings of maternity uh, hospitals of Save the Children. Um, there is, um, you can see the pictures over there where the devastation is always key. There's also the stories of Yemen that are now coming out about starvation and children being the big, biggest victims yeah. in Yemen. What has been um, Save the Children's role in those two extreme crises? There's so much need for not only Save the Children, but NGOs in general these days. We have an unprecedented number of people and also children who cannot live in their own homes, who have to, le le who have to leave their communities because of war, conflict, natural disasters, uh, poverty. Um, people are leaving their houses and their communities in unprecedented numbers. We talk about having 30 million children who had to leave their communities. These are some of the children that we saw here. And what we're seeing these days is that it looks like there are deliberate attacks on where children are. Hospitals, schools, um, places where children actually are, it looks like it's deliberate attacks. So these children, they are suffering and they're suffering a lot. One of the things we have done in Save the Children is actually to ask these children how they feel. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us, but when we ask these children how they feel, it is so clear that they are deeply traumatized. Uh, they don't sleep at night nights, they wet their beds, um, they, they can't talk, some of these children. And even though we know that this must surely be the case after six years of war, when we ask these children and we get these answers, it is, it is so sad that this is happening. And it shows us that if these children don't get help now, this, there's no future for Syria. Because how do you create a, f a future if the children are uh, in the, the state that we see them in now? I think the worry about lost generation yeah. is, is there across the board. I want to come to our audience because I know they've been watching this for so many years. They must be curious about what you, you are doing yeah. and how they potentially can participate as well. So if there's any questions from the audience for, uh, for Helle, um, please do raise your hands um, as we go along in the conversation as well. So we'll come straight to you. Um, I think we can pick up on another topic as well at this point since we're good for now, um, is Yemen is one thing that's really popped up, but there's some forgotten stories out there that you've had a chance to highlight in the last one year as well. Well, we think there's a lot of forgotten stories, and I think what is happening, in particular the Western media, is that there is a certain fatigue of the stories that we hear, and suddenly people can't hear it any longer. They can't understand the suffering in Yemen. Uh, People don't want to know that 17 million uh, people in the Horn of Africa might be entering into a food crisis that, like we have not seen uh, in many, many years in, that, uh, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Kenya last week. I want to pull up the pictures yeah. of this because, again, we, we've all seen the pictures of Syria and devastation, but I think the Horn of Africa... Exactly, but I think it's like the, the Western media, we can only cope with one crisis at a time. Um, and that's just not good enough because what we have is, a, is an effort, it has to be a long-term effort to help uh, people in the Horn of Africa. I don't know what you have here, I can hardly see it. It looks like Syria. So we have... Nope. Horn of Africa, there you go. We have Syria, Horn of Africa, Yemen, uh, which are in deep crisis now, and then we have all the other children 
in the world who get denied the right to a childhood, who get denied normal things like surviving before their, first, uh, fifth, uh, their, their fifth birthday, going to school, not becoming pregnant when they are teenagers, not going into the labor market, all these things, they're still there. And my message to the world is not of devastation and havoc and nothing can be done about it. No, it's actually rather the opposite. Because what I've seen, you asked me what have I seen over the last year and Save the Children, is basically there's so much hope uh, that we can make the world a better place. And I still believe that even after all the children that I met, all the people that I've met who are suffering, I still believe we can make the world a better place. I think we have done that over the last 30 years. Uh, we have made the world a, world a better place, but we all need to be part of that change. And many of these lovely women in this room can be part of that change. I think I want to pick up on that, but we have a question in the corner right over there. I, I think I was going to ask what gives you hope, but you... Uh, um, went there already. I see there's a lot of fatigue and kind of you get desperate and what do you do at an individual level? So the question just was, um, what do you think we as um, here as executives, yeah. and what, what can we do at a practical level to really make a difference and kind of what gives you hope for, for the future? I think there was so much interesting thing happening at this stage. I saw the panel earlier where um, Miriam and, and uh, Miriam and others were talking about that politics is one thing, and then there's action uh, between people, uh, corporate uh, action that can mean a lot these years, and I truly believe that. And one thing we're all fighting towards, uh, we have got 17 so-called sustainable development goals. We have promised the world that we will deliver on these sustainable development goals. The fact is that we are off track on all of them, off track on all of them. And then we have to ask ourselves, how can we get back on track with these? And I urge business leaders to actually play a part in this. And it's not like the old days where you wrote a check and you said, now we are doing our corporate social responsibility. That's not what it's like anymore. Partnerships and philanthropy these days, uh, is Philanthropy these days is more about partnerships, long-term partnerships where you where you create impact together. I see Johnson & Johnson is part of, the, of this, uh, this meeting and partnering up for this meeting. Johnson & Johnson is a long-standing partner of Saving Children, doing fantastic work in hygiene, child uh, survival. Um, we have many amazing partners that don't want just to write a check, but who want to seriously partner up for a, for a very long time. We had Naomi speaking here to us yesterday. She went to the Satari camp in, uh, in Jordan. Uh, what she might not have seen because she was busy talking to people there, which I appreciate, is that in Satari camp, there's a big sign uh, with Bulgari uh, on it. Bulgari, as you all know, is a luxury brand. They're helping us actually fund the work we are doing in Satari camp. And I could go on because we have so many amazing uh, partners that every day are helping to make a real difference for children on the ground. And I invite everyone, if you want to do something, um, there's a lot of opportunity. I think an interesting point then comes in with innovation as well, because um, I was reading about uh, companies like Glaxo or Unilever yeah. who have something to gain as well by contributing. They're developing... And we're developing things together, like GlaxoSmithKline, amazing company, and we've been partnering up uh, in the beginning. I'm told it was before my time. It was a bit controversial, uh, but no, no, it's not controversial anymore. What basically happened was there, there was a, a dental product. Uh, it wasn't a toothpaste. It was a dental product that we suddenly found out could be used on the umbilical cord uh, for little babies when they were born to prevent diseases. So with GlaxoSmithKline, we developed this product quite cheap that women in developing countries can now use for their babies actually preventing these children from dying. That's an amazing story where innovation from both sides, knowledge from both sides, partnering up, change a child's lives, life, change a family's life. Uh, those children will survive. Uh, they, they might not have done without that partnership. Another question right here. 
Hi, I'm Christine Sfer. I'm from uh, Lebanon, so we've been through 20 years of uh, war, so some of my childhood pictures are very similar to the picture yeah. you show, and uh, we have two million refugees out of uh, four million population, so this creates a lot of challenges. But I want to uh, look at the other side of the story. For In my experience, when kids go through tra traumas like this, and mainly war, at the end, if they are giving education, most of them become amazing entrepreneur. They become uh, resilient more than the average uh, resilient. They are scared of less things than also other adults and that they are really willing to, to change the world. So if given proper education and maybe some uh, angel investors or people that uh, trust that they can do whatever their dream is, you can end up with an amazing population. And if you look at the Lebanese youth nowadays, yeah. I think we have the highest percentage of entrepreneurs uh, in, in the world. So let's look at the yeah. bright side as well. That is so, but that is so, so much what I believe in. A, in a, uh, the, the, what you meet when you work with children every day, as I do, is that enormous resilience, that hope that is between, behind their eyes. They've seen things that no child should see, but still there is some hope that you can change that child's life. With the right psychosocial, uh, psychosocial support, with the right education, you can actually change that child's life. So not only for that child, but also for the community that uh, he or she will grow up into. I met boys who were enrolled as so child soldiers when they were 12. I met girls who were shot at because they wanted to do education. I met, met girls who were married off when they were 13. Uh, I met girls who lived in the worst slum. Uh, and all of them, they have the hope. And if they're given the chance to education, they will thrive and they will make a difference, not only for themselves, but in their community. See, that is a story of hope. And the reason why I work for Save the Children and want everyone else to work for something, it doesn't have to be Save the Children, but I just think we can make a difference because every time you change a child's life, you not only change that child's future, but the whole community, and it is possible. It's interesting as well when you talk about the, the kind of places and the kind of children that you're talking about. You came up with a childhood index yeah. of where it's good to be a kid and where it's not. And there's some shockers in that report as well. Um, if, I, if we can get um, our team to pull it up, um, that map is something that Save the Children came up with. And tell me by the names that you were surprised by. Yeah, first, uh, maybe two, two words about what it is. It's quite an amazing report. What we have done is like we've, we've uh, identified eight what we call childhood enders, marriage, violence, death, uh, of preventable diseases, malnutrition, that means that children are stunted, uh, being brought into labor when you're very uh, young. Uh, so eight, I, eight uh, I, no, no education, of course, so eight uh, childhood enders. And we have simply ranked 172 countries to show where a, li a child's life, uh, childhood is most likely to end early or most likely to actually have a, where that child is likely to have a full childhood. So that is what we have done. And when you do that, people sit up a little bit because they want to see where's my own country. I've done that, I'm Danish, so I've looked at that as well. Where's my own country? Uh, and what we're seeing is, of course, that uh, the 10 uh, lowest ranking countries, uh, this is no, Unfortunately, no surprise to us, they are African countries. But we have also seen some developed countries that should not have the ranking that they have. The United States, for example, have a ranking, I think it's number 36. Can you see it up there? No, number uh, 30, it's the top number, 10 in the top. Number 36. Um, and China has a ranking of number 47. And these are indicators that, could, that should make us all sit up and ask, how can we make a difference to change this? Because I believe strongly that every child uh, being born have the right to survive their fifth birthday. They have the right to go to school. They have the right to live protected from, from violence. They have the right not to work. Uh, they have the right not to be married when they are 14. They have the right not to be pregnant and when they're 15. All these things are rights for a child. And if we can have that discussion, all of us, try to go against the childhood enders in our own country and everywhere else, I think the world could move uh, to a new place for children. Helen, on that note, thank you very much, because a couple of weeks ago, Wolfgang Schäuble told me 
that wars come and go and you have to deal with them as a crisis, but on our doorstep is the biggest crisis of Africa. And how do you address that? You have to address the children there. So you echo his point. Thank you very much Thank for that. Thank you for having me. And I do hope you will grab Hella um, through the uh, morning and the afternoon for any questions that you have. Remember, we're all here for exactly that reason. So, Hella, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.